So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to extend that respect to any First Nations people participating in our seminar today. And yeah, today's seminar will be presented by Jonathan Griffin and his topic is Large Earthquake Recurrence in Low Seismicity Regions, Accounting for a Periodicity. I said that approximately right. Okay. A periodicity. Period. There we go. Yes. Um, so characterising earthquake hazard in low seismicity regions is challenging due to both the inherent lack of data and an incomplete theoretical understanding of the controls on earthquake occurrence away from plate boundaries. Uh, in this talk, the Otago region of southern New Zealand is used as a case study of a low seismicity region with evidence for a period a periodic earthquake recurrence. <laughs> Jonathan will get it right. Um, new paleo earthquake and slip rate data are used to extend the record of faulting dating back more than 100,000 years on two faults, the Hyde and Dunstan faults. And these data allow the variability of earthquake rates on these faults to be characterised, with novel Bayesian methods developed to forecast the probability of future earthquakes. And finally, the talk discusses the potential for application of these methods in the Australian context. And talking with Jonathan uh, a couple of days ago about this, I think he said we only have about 11 or so um, faults which have been properly characterised in Australia. So clearly we have a long way to go with this, with this work. Um, about our speaker, Jonathan Griffin joined Geoscience Australia's graduate program in 2007, following completion of a BSc and uh, Bachelor of Maths at the University of Wollongong. GA has worked in a range of earthquake and tsunami hazard programs in Australia and our region, including three years based in Jakarta, supporting Indonesia's efforts to understand their hazard and reduce risk. Jonathan's primary interests are in characterising the sources of potential earthquakes before they happen using geological, historical and instrumental data. From 2018 to 2021, he completed a PhD thesis at the University of Otago in New Zealand, of which some key findings are presented in this talk. And one of those key findings that he won't uh, present is that uh, Australian ski fields are a bit disappointing compared to those in uh, southern New Zealand. Please welcome Jonathan. Thank you, Anthony, for that introduction, and, and thanks for, for everyone who's joining uh, in person and online. Uh, so today um, I'm going to be talking about uh, understanding the, the recurrence of large earthquakes and, and focusing on regions of, of low seismicity, so regions uh, away from plate boundaries that, that don't you know, necessarily have a, have a lot of earthquakes occur and that are data poor and potentially uh, show more irregular or aperiodic earthquake recurrence. So we uh, present some, some data fr from this and, and talk about how we might treat these areas. Uh, so before I go on, I'd, I'd really like to acknowledge uh, a huge range of people that have uh, helped um, with the, the work that I'm, I'm presenting today. So uh, my PhD uh, at the University of Otago was supported by a Geoscience Australia uh, Development Award, and, and I'm very grateful for, um, I guess, Martin and, and Andy Varnicote uh, in particular for uh, being so supportive of, of the proposal to, to do that. Uh, I'm really grateful to my, my primary supervisor, Mark Sterling at, at Uni of Otago, and my co-supervisors, Ting Wang and, and Matt Gersenberger. Uh, a whole host of other people that have helped out in various ways in, with field work and, and uh, writing and, and things like that, and, and the New Zealand earthquake community. It's, it's been great to be a part of that and, and see um, you know, all, the, all the fantastic things happening there. Um, and finally, you know, very grateful to my, my family uh, down here uh, for for joining me on this, this adventure that we, we had over to Otago to Dunedin uh, to do this, this study. So today the, the question we're really looking at is, is when will the next large earthquake occur? And, and that's sort of something that we're going to explore. We're going to look at what we can find in the, in the geological record and, and look about what we can say probabilistically about when, when a future large earthquake will occur. So I'm going to look at what the, the global long-term uh, earthquake record tells us. Uh, and then I'm going to dive into the, the Otago region of, of southern New Zealand as a, a case study of a, a relatively low seismicity region, uh, but where we do have some, some good data on, on past uh, earthquake occurrence. I'm going to talk about how we can use this um, 
these data to develop uh, better probabilistic forecasts of, of the, when that, that future large earthquake might occur. And finally, I'm going to uh, finish by discussing briefly some potential application to Australia. Uh, so just for, for a bit of context of where most of this, this work is, is taking place, uh, this is the, the South Island of New, of New Zealand. And, um, you know, you can really see this, this striking feature here, really shown, uh, you know, just by the, the snow line here. It's the, the Alpine Fault. It's the main uh, plate boundary uh, cutting through the, the west coast of, of the South Island. Uh, and we've got this oblique convergence uh, between the Pacific and Australian plates of about uh, 37 uh, millimetres a year. And so over on the, on the west coast, you know, you've got, uh, it's it's mostly strike slip, but there is a lot of um, transpression as well. And you've got uplift of the Southern Alps. You've got these kind of big mountains catching a lot of rain, huge erosion rates. It's, you know, it's quite wild, but it's also quite exciting that you can go and actually um, put your put your finger on, on a plate boundary here. And so uh, here in, in this photo down the, the bottom left, um, we can sure if that mouse is showing up, but uh, in the bottom left, essentially uh, where my finger is, below that is you know late uh, late Pleistocene or early Holocene glacial gravels, and they're over thrust by uh, gouge and, and cataclysites uh, from the, the Alpine Fault damage zone. So, you know, it's really exciting to be able to go and put your finger on a plate boundary and, and poke it and, and see if anything happens. Uh, but then uh, the, the main area that I will be talking about uh, today is um, the Otago region. Uh, so it's east of the, the plate boundary in the, uh, the southeastern uh, part of um, the South Island. And you can see again in the, the snow line here, um, I'm sure if I... mouse is... anyone see a mouse? Okay. Um, Anyway, within that, that orange square there, you can see a, a series of snow lines, which is the, the ranges that have been uplifted on a, on a series of parallel um, northeast trending reverse faults. And they're the faults that I'm, I'm primarily going to be, be talking about today. Uh, so this, this key question of, of when is the, the next large earthquake going to occur? So what I'm really talking about here is considering the case of uh, repeated or recurrent large earthquakes on, a, on a, any particular fault. So, so we have faults, uh, Earthquakes occur on on faults. Uh, if we um, if we know when one has happened in the past, or when several earthquakes have happened in the past, can we make some inference about the the timing of the the next large earthquake to to happen on that? And by large, I'm, I'm meaning earthquakes that are, that leave a geological record in the landscape. So these these surface rupture, these deform the landscape and and leave a record there that we can go on and look at and and date and and um, and understand. So so we're looking at time dependence, we want to know if the timing of the next earthquake depends on, on when the last earthquake happened. And if it does, how exactly does it depend on, on those timing? And we want to answer this probabilistically. So to just introduce some, some concepts that I'll be talking about today, um, I'm going to be talking a lot about uh, the inter-event times of, of earthquakes. So uh, in each of these plots here, the, the, the vertical bars are, are the events. Um, you know, there could be anything. There could be could be bus arrivals. It could be how many emails you got in the last hour. In this case, we're talking about the timing of when earthquakes occur on, again on a particular fault. The inter-event time is the, the time between those, and we can um, describe these different records using uh, kind of qualitative descriptions. So at the top, we've got a record that might be described as more regular or what we might call quasi-periodic. In the middle, we have a, a record that is random. There's essentially no, no pattern to it and, and the inter-event times are, are ran, random. And down the bottom, we have a record that we might describe using words like clustered or episodic or bursty, uh, where we get a, a series of events happening closely together in time, and then we get very long periods of uh, nothing happening. And so we use the word aperiodicity to kind of describe the um, I guess the the degree of um, the departure from a regular or quasi periodic record. So as we go down, a periodicity increases. Now, what we can do in a statistical sense is we can fit different probability distributions to these these records, and they will look different depending on on how the how the record looks. And then we can use that to forecast the probability of that the next event in the, the series happening. So. So if we have this, this history of, of past events and we know when the most recent event happened, we have a current open interval, the time since the, the last open interval has occurred. We fit some uh, probability distribution to that, that data and we can then make a, a conditional uh, 
estimate of the likelihood of a future event happening in a particular time period of interest. So this is something that has been uh, done uh, more and more in the, in the plate boundary context. Uh, here's an example from the, the Alpine Fault that I, I mentioned before, the main plate boundary running through the, the South Island of New Zealand. And we've got these excellent uh, paleo earthquake records here of more than 20 events uh, shown in the, the bottom left. And, and what's remarkable is that these events, um, these large earthquakes on the Alpine Fault seem to happen every 300 years, you know, plus or minus 20 years. So it's remarkably regular and we can use that information. Uh, and, and this paper recently by, by Jamie Howarth um, in Nature Geoscience used that information to uh, forecast a conditional probability of a 75% chance of the next major Alpine Fault earthquake happening in the next 50 years. And so this is, you know, this is really massive. You know, it's, it's a big earthquake, high sevens, low eights, and it's, you know, there's a better and even chance that it will happen in the next 50 years. And so that can really motivate uh, our societal actions that we might take to mitigate the risk and the impacts of that event when it happens. So that's really nice, and, the, and this Alpine Fault record is really nice. It's long, it's regular, and we can, um, you know, make forecasts with that. And, and what's also nice is that this is kind of what we expect with theory. So elastic rebound theory, which was really developed by, by Reid after the um, 1906 San Francisco earthquake, uh, is, is the basis of the standard earthquake uh, cycle model. And uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with this, but you, you have a fault uh, on, on the left over here, and uh, strain uh, accumulates uh, due to tectonic loading over time, and then at some point the, the strength of the fault is, is exceeded and uh, it releases in an earthquake. And so we get this, and then the idea is that if, well, the, the tectonic loading rate is constant, fault strength doesn't change, that you'll end up with this kind of regular cycle of, of strain accumulation, releasing earthquakes, accumulation against. So this is really nice and it's it's a theory and we, and we see that on the Alpine Fault. But what we really want to now explore is, you know, does this general, does this theory sort of work more generally and, and can we actually test that? So the, the first thing we, we did here was looking at um, the global long-term earthquake record. So looking at paleo earthquake records from many faults all around the, uh, the world and, and seeing how much they, they conform to this theoretical expectation of uh, regular earthquake recurrence. So to do that, coming back to, to these plots, we, we use a, a particular measure called burstiness uh, to basically describe um, how, how bursty or, or not bursty a particular record is. So the, the plot down the bottom, the, the clustered or episodic or, or bursty record has, has higher burstiness and the, and the plot at the top that is quasi-periodic has, has a low value of burstiness. And we can calculate this from these uh, long-term uh, paleo earthquake records. So in this plot here on the on the left, we have uh, the, the burstiness that, that we've calculated from uh, long paleo earthquake records, uh, so records uh, with more than five five events in them, uh, from 80 faults from all around the world, and these are these come from um, all different tectonic environments, and we simply plot them against the the long term average rate on the on the uh, x axis there. So so to the right we've got faults that generate earthquakes um, more often, and on the left uh, we've got faults that generate earthquakes uh, less often. And what you can see is that basically most most faults in the right half of the the plot here um, have a have a negative burstiness, and that means that they're they're more quasi periodic. They're they're more uh, regular than what we might expect if it was a completely random process. As we go uh, further to the left here, and we get into lower and lower activity rate faults, uh, we see that they they end up with um, some neutral to sort of moderately low bursting which basically means we're getting um, random um, to two clustered earthquake recurrence. Uh, sorry. Now there's a lot of uncertainties here in, in dating and the, the chronologies through these events and so and just the small numbers of um, earthquakes that happen in most earthquakes mean that in testing this um, rigorously is, is challenging. So what we, we did was um, come up with an ensemble based hypothesis test here and this is shown on the, on the right hand side. And we, we took all the, the um, so that what's shown here is in the blue is what we might expect the distribution of burstiness to be for all of those faults if they gen all generated earthquakes randomly. So earthquakes occurred, uh, this is as a Poisson process, 
And then we have in the, the orange the, the distribution of, of bursiness that we get from the actual data. And so we can see that those two distributions are different and we can test that. And so we can, while at an individual fault level, it's difficult based on limited data to reject this model of, um, of random earthquake recurrence. When we use an ensemble based approach, uh, we can do that. And so what we've done here, we've, we've basically split the data into the, the high activity rate and the low activity rate uh, data here for the high activity rate faults, so faults that are generating earthquakes uh, more frequently than about once every 5,000 years, um, we can reject the, the hypothesis that they are occurring randomly. And uh, down here, we compare it to a more regular um, renewal model of, of earthquake recurrence. So it's a weekly quasi-periodic model, and we, we can't reject that. So, um, so this is significant that earthquakes on faults in, in most, you know, High activity rate regions generate uh, occur more regularly than random. On the the right hand side, we we take the low activity rate faults. Um, so some of the faults in Otago, I'll be talking about some of the faults in Australia, and we we do the same test. And in this case, we we can't reject the the model of random earthquake recurrence. So globally, most faults show what we might describe as moderately to weekly periodic earthquake recurrence. And so this is consistent with the expectations of elastic rebound theory and the standard earthquake cycle model. But then we get, when we get down to these really low activity rate faults in low seismicity regions, uh, faults that generating earthquakes on average less than sort of once every 5,000 years, we find that this, this sort of breaks down a bit and we, we can't actually reject this model of, of random earthquake recurrence. And so, you know, this poses challenges uh, for low seismicity regions. So, as I said, earthquake recurrence in, in low seismicity regions is not well explained by theory. And the other challenge that we have in these regions is, is really that, you know, we've got a lack of data. Obviously, by definition, low seismicity, we're not observing uh, many, many earthquakes, many large earthquakes. Uh, but does that necessarily translate into a lack of risk? In, in many of these regions, we can see faults in the, the landscape. And, and this is an example of one that I'll be talking about uh, in a bit more detail later, the, the Dunstan Fault. Um, there's, there's a fault in the landscape. The last earthquake was about 12,000 years ago, but you know this fault also cuts across a, a major dam um, and hydroelectric infrastructure. So you know we really want to understand better that the likelihood of, of this fault going off again. So I'm going to um, dive into the Otago region now. So so this this part of uh, southeastern New Zealand, sort of roughly between Queenstown and Dunedin, and where in the in the rain shadow of the, the Southern Alps a bit more here and, and we've got these series of kind of ranges um, that are all bounded by uh, reverse faults uh, most of them dipping to the to the northwest and uh, I'm going to focus on on this region because there's been a hypothesis in the race this region that uh, earthquake recurrence is episodic so this goes back to a paper by Beanland and Berryman in 1989 that suggested that Individual faults go through active periods where they, they might have um, several earthquakes within about 10,000 years and then quiescent periods on the order of 100,000 years. And that, that kind of hypothesis has been backed up by recent studies on, on some of the, the faults in, in this region. So I'm going to be talking um, primarily about the, the Hyde Fault, which is this one here, and the, and the Dunstan Fault up here. I'm going to talk briefly about some paleo seismology that we did on the Hyde Fault, and then I'm going to talk about some work we did on, on to obtain slip rates from the Hyde and the Dunstan Fault. So for the, the Hyde Fault, we, we did some paleo seismology, which essentially involved excavating a, a large trench uh, across the, the fault where the, the fault breaks the surface on, on this alluvial fan um, that, that's come down from the, the, the ranges here. And so you can uh, see, see quite nicely here, here beneath the digger, you've got these uh, coarse alluvial fan gravels that have been folded and thrust up over um, over these uh, finer, finer silts on the, the foot wall here. And we can uh, log all that up and essentially uh, then try and unfold, un unfold um, correlate stratigraphy across the fault and, and put it all back together again and try and estimate um, how many earthquakes have occurred here on, on the past. And then we used optically stimulated luminescence dating to, to uh, uh, determine the, the timing of those events. And so we, we ended up uh, from that fault uh, coming up with 
uh, four paleo earthquakes uh, that have occurred since about 60,000 years ago. And what we, we found that was interesting is that the, these we didn't find evidence of episodic recurrence. I mentioned that some of the other faults in the region have shown shown evidence for this. We didn't find this here. We found there was about an average inter-event time of about, about 12,000 years. And while there's uncertainties around that, we didn't find evidence for these kind of long periods of, of quiescence. The other thing that we found in, uh, interesting when we started to um, plot uh, the data from, from this fault and from other faults that have been studied uh, within Otago here, we, we didn't find any evidence that it was kind of out of phase or in phase with other faults in the, in the region. So part of that hypothesis of episodic earthquake recurrence was this idea that one fault is kind of doing all the work for a system and it has several earthquakes and then the, the locus of deformation migrates. And so this is it's starting to challenge that, that hypothesis. And, and what we see here is that, uh, for example, in the, the east, we've got uh, records from the, the tea tree and Akatori faults and that the, the paleo earthquakes timings don't overlap for those faults. So they're, they're sort of neighbouring faults and they appear to have been generating earthquakes during different periods of time. Uh, for, for the Hyde fault, we see that it's generating some earthquakes within the same general period of time as the, the tea tree and, and the Dunstan fault um, over here. So what we're, what we're seeing is that it is a little bit more complex and that simple model of episodicity um, maybe, you know, isn't, needs to be refined a little. So we've we've got four events there, and you know, as anyone who's done any statistics, a, a number of four four things isn't a huge amount of data to um, to sort of make inference on. So what we're going to ask now is is can we go go further back in time? So this is um, looking at slip rates now. So trying to go back uh, and see if we can look at the the slip rates further back in time. So when we do paleo seismology, we dig a trench across the the fault. And you know, there's there's limits to basically how big and, and deep that that trench can be, um, and how many events that we'll capture. And this is particularly the the case for reverse faulting because each subsequent earthquake buries the the evidence of, of previous earthquakes. So further back in time you go, the, the deeper you sort of want to go. So we're going to use some different techniques here, and we're going to to go try and go back in time on the the Hyde fault and also on the the Dunstan fault. And these faults are interesting. I just talked about the Hyde fault. We've got four Pele earthquakes fairly evenly spaced. On the Dunstan fault, we have a, a Pele earthquake record with four to six earthquakes between about twelve and twenty four thousand years ago, and we've got a long open interval before that. Um, you know, probably going back another twenty or thirty thousand years, and we've got no earthquake since twelve thousand. So we've got more of a, a clustered model there. So what we're going to do by going back in time is trying to sort of put some constraints on the, the longer term behavior of these faults. So to do this, we used um, beryllium-10 cosmogenic radionuclide dating of boulders um, on fan surf, on alluvial fan surfaces that have been uh, faulted by, by these faults. And so basically um, how this works in, in my limited understanding is that, you know, things go bang in space. Many millions of years ago, you get cosmic rays traveling through the through the cosmos down in the atmosphere, generating secondary particles, and that these interact with uh, quartz uh, in the in the rocks um, on the surface and generate this beryllium-10 isotope. And, and it's quite depth dependent, so, so rocks that are, that are buried are, are not going to be generating this isotope. So it's a measure of exposure age. And so we can relate that to the deposition of these fans by saying that these these alluvial fans have come down probably in sort of mass wasting events off the off the ranges and we've had um, boulders deposited sitting on the surface, fresh surfaces exposed to the, the cosmos. And then from that point, the point of formation or deposition of the surface, they start to accumulate this beryllium-10 isotope. And so this was measured at, at ANSTAR and then used to um, determine the, estimate the age of formation of these surfaces. So this is uh, showing uh, some some example and some results from the, the Hyde fault here. So on the left we have uh, a lidar uh, hillshade model, and you can see there's a there's a whole series of um, different fan surfaces here, and we've mapped them out in different colours that, and we can determine the relative ages of them based on their um, the deposition histories there. And these are quite large, so these ones uh, looking in the image on the top right uh, are sort of up to nearly 30 metres high. So you've, you're looking at about 30 metres of 
verdict loss set on, on those faults and, and the fault stipping, so even greater slip on the actual fault itself. And so we've got these these rocks on the on the surface that we've been able to date, and, and here we go back to about 110,000 years. And it's similarly, uh, this is the, the site on the, on the Dunson Fault. We have a, a nice uh, flight of alluvial fan terraces uh, shown here in the in the lidar on the left, um, stepping down in in age. So as as we as we step down to to a lower terrace, we're we're getting younger. And the oldest terrace here, we're getting ages back of up to sort of 320,000 years. So this was, you know, older than we, we really expected. Um, and, you know, probably at the limits of where we can apply this, this sort of technique, at least in this kind of environment, you, you start to get some errors coming in with, with boulders that have flaked off bits and, and things like that. So we've got these, we've got the ages um, of these surfaces with some uncertainties. And then we've also measured the vertical uh, displacement of those surfaces due to faulting since they've been deposited. And so we can then <clears throat> use that to get at vertical displacement rates or, or slip rates. And so we can plot up each of these, these data points and then start to um, fit, fit curves to them and, and look at kind of the long-term average fit. And then we can also look at the incremental fits as well. So between each, each data point and start to get an idea of how how variable um, the, the slip rate is and, and I guess the, the key point here is that there's some variation that you see on kind of the, a 10,000 year time scale so kind of somewhat reminiscent of that that episodic earthquake recurrence but model but at the same time once we're kind of averaging out over 100,000 year time scales the the rate of uplift is, is approximately linear and so this is essentially bounding how irregular or how strongly clustered some of these um, earthquake records might be. So we had that clustered earthquake record for the Dunstan fault that wasn't really constrained um, with the open interval uh, prior to it. And so this is starting to, to bound that and, and help us um, understand that while there might be variability in earthquake rates over the long term, you know, this fault just keeps going up and, and we, we want to hit that long term slip rate as well. So coming back to this question of when will the next large earthquake occur on these faults? And now, of course, we're going to answer this question probabilistically. Um, I'm not, not into earthquake prediction, uh, but we're going to try and use this data to, to get a handle on, on the chance, if you like, of, the, of a future large earthquake occurring on, on one of these faults. So I talked to the, um, at the start about the, the Alpine fault record and where you have a really nice long paleo earthquake record and it's, it's fairly regular. You can essentially fit some kind of statistical model to that and you can use that to get your conditional probability. But what we more often have in, in, in these low seismicity regions is something that look like, looks like this. We might have a few events, three or four events, um, some open interval back in time and you know then essentially no data. And so we really don't know is this just, you know, have we just observed some cluster and there's a really long period of quiescence before it, or is it actually a more regular process? And we, we've just seen the last three events. So this is where we try and bring in this longer term slip rate or, or vertical displacement rate data, because that's starting to give that long term context that we can't necessarily get from the, the paleo earthquake record. So we want to stitch that together. And what we want to do is then relate that to a potential number of events. So when we do the do the trenching in the paleo earthquake record we we get an estimate of how much displacement happens in a single event so then when we have a you know a faulted terrace or something that's been offset say say five meters within a uh, hundred thousand years we can use that to to estimate that approximately four events might have might have generated that and again we we deal a lot with all this probabilistically so we want to put all that information together to fit some kind of uh, distribution to it to then get at our conditional probability. I'm um, going to get a little technical here. We, what we use um, to do this is uh, this, this Brownian passage time distribution, which is based on this idea of a, a Brownian relaxation oscillator. So if we go back to our idea that I, I presented at the start about elastic rebound theory, the idea of constant strain accumulation, uh, releasing earthquakes in this kind of quasi-periodic cycle on the left here, if we then add noise to that, we can start to generate more irregular um, earthquake rec recurrence. And so what's shown on the, on the right hand panels here um, at the top is, is essentially that, that model um, with, with 
small amounts of noise and we're going to end up with fairly regular um, uh, earthquake re recurrence happening here. And as we go down the plot there, we start increasing the, the noise to signal rate or noise to loading rate ratio. And we're starting to get these more irregular um, failures in the system, more irregular earthquakes occurring. And so this is really nice that then we, we take this kind of model of this Brownian relaxation oscillator and the interevent times follow this distribution called the Brownian passage time distribution, also known as the, the inverse Gaussian. And what's nice about this is that it, this distribution has a parameter alpha, which is the aperiodicity. And so we can link that directly back to the, the measures of aperiodicity that I discussed at the, the start of this talk that we might take from a, a particular um, record. And so we can look at that and, um, and basically we're trying to estimate that parameter and that's going to then determine the, the shape of the distribution and whether all the inter-event times are, are similar or whether they're, they're strongly clustered with many short ones and an occasional long one. So to, we want to estimate the parameters of this distribution using the data we have. So the, the slip rate data and the paleo earthquake data. There's some, been some previous uh, work um, by, by David Rose in particular on this uh, using an assumption of, of quasi periodic earthquake recurrence um, with applications to places like the Alpine Fault and the Wellington Fault. Uh, and then we've got Delphine Fitzsenz's um, sort of update which started to um, bring in the, the combination of incremental slip rate data and, and paleo earthquake data. What we do here is um, is, is somewhat similar to, to these, uh, but what we're, we're doing is we're jointly estimating the model parameters from both the paleo earthquake and, and slip rate data um, at once, and we can use some property, properties of the BPT distribution to, to do that. So we're we're fitting data to single events from the paleo earthquake record, and we're fitting uh, fitting the model sorry to single events from the paleo earthquake record, and we're fitting the the model to Multiple, event, multiple events that are captured in the, the slip rate record and we're doing that together and we don't assume quasi-periodic recurrence so we're saying we're in a low seismicity region we're not going to assume that um, everything sort of follows this nice elastic rebound model and so we can then fully account for uncertainties in, in data obviously there's lots of data uh, dating uncertainties in the, the chronologies for these these kind of records um, and then we get uncertainties on our parameter estimates and we can take that forward into a forecast of future earthquake probability. So this is just showing um, the, the parameter estimates um, and the posterior plots for uh, the data from the Dunstan Fault. And I don't need you to look at these too closely. The, the main point here is that on the left, we're only fitting to the paleo earthquake record and that, that dark gray area is smeared out across. So we're really not constraining the, the model very well. We don't know if it's a really strongly clustered record and we've just seen it one cluster or we don't know if it's actually more regular and, and uh, you know and it's going off uh, much more regularly because we just don't have enough data to, to, to say that. And then on the right we bring in that um, incremental slip rate data. So that was the, those slip rates going back to about 320,000 years and you can see that that dark gray area is, is much more concentrated now so we're really getting much stronger constraints by bringing in that paleo, that slip rate data, even though it doesn't have the same, you know, event by event resolution of the paleo earthquake record, um, because it's showing that this fault is does just keep going up um, and keep generating earthquakes, that allows us to get a much tighter constraint on the model. And so we then do that to, to develop our our conditional forecasts going forward. Um, these are these are plots of the hazard rate, which is essentially the, the instantaneous probability of an earthquake on that fault, uh, given the um, plotted against the time elapsed uh, since the most recent earthquake that, that occurred. Uh, for both of these faults, the most recent earthquake was about 11 or 12,000 years ago. And the shape of the curve um, sort of illustrates this, this, this different behavior. So on the, the Dunstan fault here, we've um, if we just follow the, the mean curve after an event happens, probability of a future sort of earthquake happening straight away is, is low, so strains being been released. It then goes up quickly before decaying back to this background rate. So this is kind of this clustered model that, you know, when you've had an event a few thousand years ago, then your chance of another event is high. As you go on in time, you actually get back to this kind of lower background rate, which might be the, the rate or the probability of kickstarting into another episode of activity. On the hide fault, we see different a different kind of behaviour. We see essentially that the the um, the black curve there is is going up and then approaching an asymptotic level. And so this is more of the the kind of quasi periodic 
um, behavior that we see on, on other plate boundary faults. And uh, where, again, chance of an earthquake is low immediately after an earthquake, but in this case, we're, we're saying that it's just slowly, slowly going up in time, uh, approaching that level. And so we can use that to, to calculate the, um, by integrating over this to calculate the conditional probability of a future earthquake in, uh, uh, in, in a given time period of interest. So if we consider the next 500 years um, from now for the, for the Dunstan fault, we get about a 2.5% chance compared to a 3.5% chance for the, for the high fault. So it's a low seismicity region. Of course, these numbers are, are much smaller than the 75% in 50 years uh, probability you get for the, the Alpine fault. But these are the numbers that can try and get, that we can put into seismic hazard assessment that can inform the, the design of structures uh, in these regions. So how is this all relevant to Australia? And um, I hope Paul Somerville, Somerville forgives me for this. Um, he, he made the mistake, and let this be a lesson to everyone, of uh, joking to a reporter after the uh, Woods Point earthquake north of Melbourne uh, late last year uh, to say we can blame this earthquake on the Kiwis. And uh, the New Zealand tabloid media had a field day with this and described it as a, a seismic underarm. And but what the point that uh, Paul was trying to make is that, you know, we've got this plate boundary uh, down here uh, running through New Zealand and the convergence there, uh, the um, it's oblique between the, the relative plate motion is oblique to the, the up and fold. And so we've got this convergent component and I've talked about that sort of convergent component in the Otago region to the east of the Alpine fault here. And yet in southeastern Australia, we have something similar going on. So we've got this kind of northwest southeast directed uh, convergent stress field here. And, um, you know, the focal mechanism of the, the Woods Point earthquake is, is largely consistent with that. So so there's there's a link there. Um, but I guess the, the real point to make in terms of application to Australia is that you know, we've got all these near tectonic features identified, which is, you know, primarily the, the work of Dan Clark. Uh, we've got over 350 near tectonic features identified and less than a dozen of them have really been characterised with any kind of geological constraints on how often earthquakes happen, how big they are, do they happen regularly, do they happen irregularly. And so that means that when we come to doing our, our national seismic hazard assessment uh, to underpin a, a range of earthquake mitigation, efforts, we're really relying on expert judgment as opposed to data. So we've got limited data on a few faults. We use as expert judgment to basically extend that data to the other 340 odd, odd faults in Australia. And so, you know, there really is scope here to, to do more, more data collection and to start applying some of these kind of techniques that I've been talking about uh, here in Australia. And I, I just show as an example to, to finish here, uh, down in the in the snowy mountains, we've got the um, these are, these red lines are, are some of the near tectonic features that, that Dan has mapped down here. This is the uh, the the Berrydale wrench, and you know if we zoom in on, on some of the lidar data, we can see um, on this this right hand image we've got a what you, looks to be a fairly youthful kind of stream environment, and uh, there's uh, an offset along that that fault there. There's a vertical offset of about two meters a, across that. Um, and probably a, a larger strike that um, offset as well. And if we go further along the fault, this is about a kilometre to the to the northwest. We have an older, what appears to be a, a sort of alluvial fan surface that has been offset about um, eight metres or so. So you know, multiple earthquakes um, have have offset that that surface, uh, and and we don't know how old they are. Um, you know, we can eyeball the geomorphology and 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 say. You know, this is this is older than that one, but we really can't quantitatively yet constrain that. And and so there's, you know, a real opportunity here. Uh, and there's, you know, this is just an example. There's there's plenty of other other examples um, throughout the Snowy Mountains and indeed throughout many of the other areas that, that Dan's mapped in, in Australia, uh, where we could begin to to actually get some constraints on on the activity rates of these faults. And this is significant here again. I talked about in the in the Otago context that the importance of understanding the recurrence on the Dunstan Fault to the, the big dam and hydroelectric uh, plant that, that ran across the fault there. And, and there's very similar things happening in the, in the Snowy Mountains there. We've got Snowy 2.0 going on. We've got expansion of, of the infrastructure. And it's really, you know, fundamental infrastructure for, um, you know, supporting Australia's um, energy security going forward. And, you know, at present, 
We know that there's these, these faults around there. We know it's a low seismicity region. We know they're not generating earthquakes every 300 years like the Alpine Fault, but we don't actually know how often they are generating earthquakes. Um, and so there's a real opportunity there to actually do some fundamental data collection and, and start to characterise the, the hazard better. So to, to summarise, um, globally, most faults do generate earthquakes more regularly than a, than a random process. And uh, while I was talking mostly in this talk about low seismicity regions in, in more active regions, most faults are generating earthquakes more regularly than random. And this is really nice because it's um, you know, in line with what is predicted by elastic rebound theory. When we come to low seismicity regions, it sort of breaks down a bit and we don't have a really good theory to explain why earthquakes occur uh, when they do in, in these regions. When I, I sort of looked at the Otago region, um, we started to find that there's these diverse recurrent styles observed. So some faults are, um, are exhibiting this kind of episodic behaviour, but others like the Hyde seem to generate earthquakes more regularly. And so this is showing that we can't really assume too much about some of these regions um, in terms of how these faults behave. And so that really then um, led to the development of this new kind of approach for developing time dependent earthquake forecasts, combining the paleo earthquake and slip rate records. And, and one of the key things in this, this approach is to, to kind of remove some of those assumptions about is it quasi periodic, is it random, is it clustered, and, and kind of let the, the data do the talking. And so, and finally, there's a, a lot of potential for application. Um, of, of these methods in, in Australia, but you know we really need to uh, get out there and, and collect some more data. So thank you very much. And are there any questions?